Hey, Natalie. Hey, Raf. How are you? Yeah, I am awesome. How are you? I'm good. I feel like I've seen you so many times this week. I saw you for a tutorial and then Christmas party. And then now it's like a banner week for yeah. one-on-one with Raph. We've been hanging out. Yeah. Yep. This is fun. I'm looking forward to our convo. What are we going to talk about? Today, we're going to talk about working with beginners and how to be successful working with beginners. Because I think anybody can work with beginners. Yeah, I, th- I think we all have to work with beginners because you don't get experienced clients unless you start beginners. So uh, what does successful mean in your definition of working with beginners? Success means that my students or my clients walk in, they may walk in nervous, but they leave really, really happy that they have been moving and they felt challenged and they felt successful and they cannot wait to come back. That's success. But it has to be all, I'd like it to be all three, that they felt appropriately challenged. They felt like they had a great workout. They felt like they may learn, they've learned something and they just cannot wait to come back. It has to be all three for me. Yeah. I like that definition. I mean, I basically, I think if they like it so much that they come back to me, that's that's a win. That's the win. That's true. I'm going for. I want to be their dopamine dealer. I think that's what it boil, boils down to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the problem that we're solving here is, uh, and, and you know, maybe maybe uh, this is different uh, f- uh, for others, but for me, um, in the studio that I owned, when you, I guess, when you own it, when you own a, a, a reasonably large-ish studio you need a lot of people coming in through the door. So the majority of our clients were beginners at any on any given day. You know, the majority of our people were beginners because a lot of those beginners churn, you know, a lot of them don't stick. And then once they do stick, then they often stick long term. But yeah, so I think uh, deal, you know, if you work in a reasonably high volume environment, whether a gym or a large studio, like you have to be good at working with beginners because that's kind of like, the major part of your job description. And even if you work in a more boutique environment where it's like one-on-one or, you know, three-on-one or four-on-one and you have a lot of long-term clients, well, those clients get to be long-term by starting as beginners. So I think all of, you know, all this still applies, you know, one way or the other. I guess the only person maybe this might not be of interest to is someone like who's got a totally full schedule of long-term clients and is not taking on new clients (laughs) at this time. It's like, okay, you can probably just skip ahead to the next episode. Yeah, that's a superstar Pilates instructor right there. (laughs) You're awesome. (laughs) I have no more room. I'm not taking new clients. All of my clients have stayed with me for the last 30 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. High five, early bark, and um, uh, see you next time. All right. But for all the rest of you, uh, so, and do you think there's an elephant? Is there an elephant here? I can speak for my own experience and the elephant in the room here where I come from is that the best way to work with a beginner student is to do very, very, very easy exercises. So pre-Pilates and teaching them all about alignment and biomechanical principles before you can advance them to something a little bit more challenging or with more load. At least that that's the way that I see it. Yeah. I learned that when I, when I learned stop Pilates and I taught that for a long time, the concept that uh, stability has to come before load. You can't load someone until they're quote stable. Um, yeah, I, I just saw that the other day. Uh, my friend Robin, Robin Paul, I think you. Shout out, Robin. Awesome, awesome Instagram post the other day, Robin. I know. <sighs> She's rocking it right now, Robin. Doing sit-ups won't give you a flat tummy. Sorry. I know. She's amazing. <laughs> Robin shared with me an Instagram post. We do this every now and then where we see something on Instagram and we have to we share it with each other. And she showed me something where it was a pretty famous at least famous on Instagram, a pretty famous Pilates teacher who was talking about how some beginner clients really crave heavier springs or heavier load and why that's not 
the right thing to do because they need to really focus on movement and form. And if you're doing those things, you don't need a heavy load. Have you heard that before? Like you don't need more load if you are focusing on the movement. So she, we were, we were just kind of shaking our heads at that. And it's just like, I don't understand what the big deal is. If they want another spring, why don't you just give them another spring? I mean, let's give people space to try to figure things out for themselves and let them be the experts in their own body and their own practice. Yeah. I've, I've been that person. You know, I have two. <laughs> so, yeah, I have two. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to dis- respectfully disagree with that position. I think uh, load them up uh, within within limits, uh, and it's not because not because of technique or form. It's just because of DOMS. I think for beginners, that's why I wouldn't load them up too much. I'd load them up like lightly to moderately. Uh, just because otherwise they'll have a hellish set of doms the next day and they'll be like, holy shit, this Pilates stuff really hurts. I'm not coming back. (laughs) Well, I guess maybe, I mean, another way to look at it, Raph, is let's define what a beginner is because will an Olympic weightlifter who comes to Pilates for the first time, they could probably handle a lot of load. Maybe they just don't know what the reformer is. Yeah. Well, I I think – I mean, that's a really good point. And, you know, strength is specific. I think we've talked about that previously on this podcast, but which means that you can be really strong, you know, being really strong sort of is only half a statement. You're really strong at a certain thing. You know, you can be really strong at lifting a barbell, which doesn't mean you're really strong at doing teasers on the long box, you know, not the same skill. So, so you can, you know, but of course, somebody who can lift triple their body weight above their head is probably going to be better at teaser than someone who has trouble getting out of a sofa, you know. Um, uh, but you, you could be a high-level uh, athlete of some kind, come along to parties and then still be super sore the next day because you've done unaccustomed exercise in unaccustomed ranges of motion and stuff. So, yeah, I, but I think, you know, for, for, for the purposes of today's conversation, I really like to define a beginner as, you know, what I believe, you know, 95% of the people who walk through the doors of 95% of the Pilates studios in the world for the first time are going to be, which is like basically previously mostly sedentary people. Maybe they've been fit in the past, but, you know, now they've had a couple of kids and not looked after themselves for a decade or, you know, they're even older and have arthritis or whatever. So they're, they're, I think basically I'm thinking – when I think when I say beginner – I'm thinking like a basically a sedentary, untrained or detrained person who doesn't necessarily have a lot of body awareness or flexibility or, you know, can't do a full push up, um, you know, that kind of thing. I like it. Let's go with that. I have ideas about that, about those kinds of clients. All right. So that's, that's the client we're talking about. All right. So. And uh, the elephant that you mentioned is that we need to essentially, you know, you start with pre-Pilates and all the, all, the, all of the anatomy and biomechanics education, teaching the Pilates principles or the stop Pilates biomechanical principles or how to stabilize their body part, etc. How to breathe correctly. Right. We shouldn't load them until they're, quote, stable. Right. So I, I agree that's an elephant. But I also think in Australia, and so I think that's maybe more of an elephant in from my perception, what, you know, from talking to you and a bunch of other folk, uh, in the U S Europe and UK and probably in Australia, I'm sure we still have that in Australia, but I think probably in Australia, another, uh, elephant that we have is kind of the flip side of that coin, which is, I think we sometimes tend to overload beginners. Like if we're thinking about a fitness Pilates context, we've got a dozen reformers in a room. It's all about high intensity and getting the burn, and you know, abs, glutes, and thighs. Then, you know, it. I think in that situation we can err on the side of like smashing that person too hard day one, and basically they can't go to the toilet for a week because they can't actually bend their knees or your hips. <laughs> I mean, that was me when I started taking Pilates with my Australian <laughs> instructors. It's scary. Yeah, you guys are really good at smashing us. That's true. Yeah, which which people can get addicted to the burn, but but first first day, first week, second week, it like that DOMS can be like very very intense, 
And if you're not used to it, it can be a very aversive experience where people's like, oh, this is terrible. I'm not going <laughs> to, this is not fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not doing, I'm not going to keep doing this because it's just, it's, it's taken the joy out of my life for like four days after the class. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, so we try, I guess what we're trying to find is the Goldilocks amount of load for, for a beginner, you know, not too little, not too much, just right. Um, and yeah, I think we've, we've got a, I've got a list and I'm, I'm pretty sure you've got a list and I might, there might be a lot of overlap on the lists. <laughs> Of yeah, simple I, strategies I hope so. that are yeah yeah that are low cost <laughs> and high impact that we can uh, basically you know put that smile on their face as they walk out and have them going yes can't wait to see you again next Tuesday. I like so, it. Um, yes. All right. So, uh, do you want to start off, or do you want me to start off? I'll start off with with what I. With what I envision are my my three main strategies, and maybe we can talk about them one by one. So my first strategy yeah. is motivational. The mm -hmm. second strategy would be communication strategies. And the third mm -hmm. would be programming strategies. And in terms of the motivational strategies, I'm thinking optimal theory of motor learning. Uh, autonomy, external focus of attention, and yeah. uh, mastery experience, yeah. Yeah, the th I, I like to go by the three C's. That's how I remember it with optimal um, theory is the three C's are confidence, choice, and cues. And cues could absolutely fall under the communication category, but the confidence and the choice. I also, um, along with choice, I I do, uh, I think there's also collaboration that falls under choice too. But yeah, building confidence, giving clients choice. And dear listener, if you're sort of scratching your head and going, what the heck's optimal theory, confidence, choice, autonomy, et cetera, uh, go back to, I think it's episode 28-ish. It's called How to Teach Movement Skills with Gabby Wolf and Rebecca Luthwaite, and that will bring you up to speed on um, current best evidence on how to teach movement skills to humans. So, And the th name of the theory um, that encompasses all of this current evidence is called optimal theory. So, all right. So, communication, motivation, and programming skills. I guess I, I mean I kind of made a list here, but I, I don't. I, I wasn't as organised as you. I didn't kind of put it into categories. <laughs> I've just got like I actually. I guess what I've got is mine is kind of in chronological order, from like you know when they walk in the door to. You know, when they walk out the door, like here, here are the kind of things that you would do. And I think definitely I, you could, the things I've got on my list, you could sort of put them in one or more of those categories. But I think there's also a lot of crossover. Like I think the programming is motivational. I think the communication is motivational. Um, yeah. So, um, all right. So let, well, let's start. Where do you want to start? Uh, let's start with talking about building confidence. Okay. Let's start with talking about building confidence. I mean, we could even talk about them walking through the door. I know that's how Heath starts off his lecture for working with beginners when they walk in and they're looking around nervous and feeling you can see all over their face whether they made the right decision yeah. to even show up. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I think this is, I think this is, we're doing both because uh, a lot of times beginners don't have a lot of confidence. They're feeling anxious. Like you say, they've probably, you know, in many cases been screwing up the courage to step foot inside a Pilates studio for a long time. You know, maybe they're worried about they're the wrong shape or they're overweight or they're not strong or they don't have the right brand of leggings or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and even if they don't have any of those particular sort of insecurities, like they're just in a brand new environment, they don't know the kind of social rules of engagement and the culture and the kind of way we do things around here. Um, or any of the people. And so, um, it, you know, like I think just about every human would feel like some degree of nervousness walking into a brand new environment where they know nothing, they don't know the ropes. Um, and they're almost by definition like the least experienced person in the room um, at the activity that takes place in that uh, situation. So, they, you know, I think it'll be a pretty rare egg that doesn't have some level of <laughs> 
anxiety <laughs> walking into a Pilates studio for the first time. Um, one of the things that I think the the first thing, in fact, that is important is in my in my view, is to greet people immediately. Like this is a total pet peeve of mine that when you walk into a, a studio, when when a new client walks into a studio and the, the instructor's there behind the desk talking either to another staff member or talking to another client, and they, they just keep talking and ignore that person who walked in. That is like a strong social signal that you you are not one of us. You know, you will wait till we're ready, and then we will deign to acknowledge you. And I don't think it's ever meant in that way, you know, like it just you just like get involved in a great conversation with somebody, right? And you're in the middle of a conversation, and someone walks in. It's like it's it's. I think it's normal human behavior if you're in the middle of a conversation to focus on the person you're conversing with, right? But I think when you're an instructor or working on the reception or whatever at, at, in a studio, like that's not a normal human situation. You're actually there as a representative of the business, and it's your job to. I think part, you know. Job number one on the list of being a representative of the business is to make everyone feel welcome in the business. Uh, and I think that starts by acknowledging people immediately, like within like three seconds after they walk in the door. And it doesn't have to be a big speech or anything, just be like a smile and a wave and a like hold a finger up and be like, I'll be with you in a minute sort of thing. But just acknowledging, you know, pause, like, hey, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. I totally agree with that. That actually happened to me when I had my very first experience at a Pilates studio is I walked in and there was someone at the reception desk who just completely ignored me. And I had to be the one to go up there and say, excuse me, (laughs) I'm brand new and I'd like to take classes. I, I, you're an introvert. Already they've lost points. Already they've lost points, right? Right. And you're an introvert and I'm an introvert. And one of the things that I really appreciated, um, in Heath's lecture to our students about working with beginners, because I believe Heath is an introvert as well. And he says in the lecture, (laughs) he says in the lecture, um, you, you really can't be an introvert when you are working, you have to go first. And it really stuck with me because that's true when you're the Pilates teacher. And oftentimes the instructors is the receptionist these days. There typically isn't a front desk anymore. It is really important to be on the lookout for your new students and um, be willing to greet them right away and make them feel at ease. Yeah. It's like being a parent, you know, you have to be the adult in the room, even when you don't feel like being it, you know, you want to, really, (laughs) you want to throw a tantrum and storm. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Noted for next time. Yeah. uh, I think it's so important. And uh, actually if I was a studio owner um, still, I would absolutely make it a KPI, a key performance indicator, like uh, for all of my team, that everyone is greeted within five seconds after walking in the door. Like that would be a a baseline performance measure that's like, okay, this tells me whether you're doing a good job or not. Um, And it wouldn't be the only thing, obviously, (laughs) that I'd measure performance on, but that would certainly be a a thing, a KPI, if, if I still had a studio. Yeah, it's basic customer service. Yeah. And, but I think like for, you know, it's basic customer service a hundred percent, but I think it's also just like not intuitive human behavior. So I think it's a discipline that we each have to practice and develop. And if you're, if you're in deep conversation with an, with another client, you just have to develop the skill of saying, oh, excuse me for a sec. And then, you know, interrupting them in mid flow and just go, Hey, sorry. Hey there, I'll be with you in a moment. So great you're here. Grab a seat. You know? Um, and if you're, if, and if you're in conversation with another staff member, would that just has to stop? Like you, you, that's conversation, that conversation is over now because the customer's walked in the door and that, that you can't wait till you finish your story or it, it just has to be like in mid word, you have to stop when that client walks in the door because we're here for the clients. We're not here to chit chat, you know? Um, all right. So there's, there's, I think that's it. I think. That is one of the most high leverage activities, you know, changes you could make if you're not already doing it. Like, because first impressions are so powerful and so important. And if you do nothing else, you just keep doing everything you're currently doing, but you just 
greet everyone within five seconds after they walk in the door, I, I think you'll you'll get more clients and you'll keep more clients. I would agree with that. All right. So they've they've entered. Uh, you've you know you welcome them. Then you you know you say hi and. I think it, you know, you also need to uh, give them a little, uh, you know, we always used to give them a little tour of the premises, like here's the bathroom, here's the change room, here's where you put your bag, here's the where you get your tea, here's the rubbish bin, here's the first aid kit, you know, here's where you wait for the class, da da da, you know. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, if you don't have time and if there's it's just by yourself and there's like clients coming in all over the place and you can't sort of leave the front desk or whatever, I think having even just like doing a little map, you know, just draw up a little hand-drawn map and photocopy it, print it out, you know, have it sitting there and just like you are here, here's the change room, here's the blah, 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 here's the studio, here's the whatever. Um, that stuff is really important, I think, because when – when you're in a new environment, like you really don't, it's very hard to get your bearings and it, it's, it's hard to know. It's like when you're, when you're, when you walk into a new building for the first time, it's like, it's hard to know, like, where are the bathrooms and where are the, you know, if I go through this door, will I walk into a room full of people like in Shavasana and I'll be like the elephant clumping into the room <laughs> or is that the kitchen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, just to put people's, uh, reduce people's anxiety level. It's really valuable for them to be clear on where to go, what to do. You know, leave your sh- t- shoes off, leave them on that rack there. Get changed in that room here. Studios that direction. Class starts promptly at such and such a time. Wait on that seat outside the door. See you in there. You know, help yourself to tea off the off the stand. Yeah, I'm really lucky because the studio I work for is really tiny. So if I can't leave the classroom. I'm, I just point that way and say the bathroom's just right over there. You're going to see the changing room um, right to the left. So I can do that. But I think one of the things that I really appreciate and I try to remember for my new clients coming in is that, you know, when they walk in, they might take a look. They might be able to see the classroom with all of the machines. And that's intimidating if you've never really seen or worked on a machine like that before. So it's not just any building, right? It's not like them walking into a restaurant or a bank or a store. They're walking into a Pilates studio, which by any argument seems like a very, very strange and foreign place. So like, I really do believe that my job is to just be like, you're all right. We're just going to be right here. Don't worry about it. We're going to, you're in the right place. It's going to be fun. You know, Go use the bathroom, and and I'll once you come into the classroom, I'll I'll have you take a look at the machines over here. Yeah, what a good point. Yeah, we forget because we look at these machines multiple times a day that it's such a weird thing, and that's our curse of knowledge right there. It like, is so weird. what? <laughs> <laughs> a Pilates reformer is one of the weirdest things. Well, the Pilates reformer, and then they, you know, my students will, my clients will go up to the bathroom and they take a look over here and they see the full Cadillac with like fuzzy nooses hanging from like metal bars and like pedipoles and just all kinds of crazy shit. And I'm, and you can see the look on their face. It's just like, what is happening? Like, what is this place? Yeah. I think something that, that, uh, and I don't know, um, again, North America or UK or Europe so much, but in Australia here, we tend to run a lot of back to back classes and often, You'll come in, and the beginner might come in like you know ten minutes early if they if you've done a good job in orientating them and telling them when to get there, and they've found the parking and all of that. Um, and so that you know, they'll just witness like the peak intensity of the previous class, which might be an advanced class or whatever. And it's like there's everyone doing headstands and splits and one handed push ups and high bridge and whatever. And you know, and so I think it's I think it's also really important to. Uh, they they can be like like holy shit you're not going to ask me to do that are you <laughs> like I'm not I'm, <laughs> that is this you know so I think uh, just acknowledging like hey you're in the right place beginners class is next don't worry <laughs> like you're here for the beginners class great you know you're in the right spot yeah by the way that's not a beginners class in there that's the advanced class <laughs> that'll be you that'll be you in twelve months that's true actually my. My beginner class, I do a three class shift on Saturdays and my beginner class is the last class. So they do get to see a more advanced class 
Um, and we can talk about this later, but they, they, they do get my, I do tell my students, you're not going to be doing snake, but we are going to be doing something similar to it. So it'll, it's going to be fun. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, they get to see a lot of fun tricks and things like that. Yeah. All right. So what about, um, now we're starting class, uh, and I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming this is not a one-on-one situation because I mean, I guess we're talking about a class, right? So it might be four on one, might be 10 on one, might be 20 on one, whatever, but basically it's, it's not one-on-one, right? It's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a bespoke situation. We're talking about a situation where basically everyone's kind of doing the same thing together in a class uh, and you might be layering it and, and giving different levels, et cetera, for, for people, for levels of fitness, but basically everyone's doing the same exercise, you know, some version of yeah. the same exercise at the same time. Everybody gets the same menu. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think when you, when you start, like my strategy has always been, and I'm thinking about reformer, but I guess this could apply equally to Matt or whatever. If you're doing chair classes or tower classes or spring wall classes or whatever, it could apply the same, which is, I think, you know, when I was taught in my stop play training and what I used to teach people. And in fact, what we did at my studio for the first, for the longest time was we had like an we, I used to give like a five minute lecture to people about here's the springs and here's the gear bar and here's how to adjust the gear bar and here's, how, here's the carriage stopper and here's the straps and here's how to adjust the straps and here's the foot bar and here's how to adjust the foot bar. And here's how to adjust the headrest and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you could just see people like freaking out and going like, okay, I've forgotten the first thing you told me already. What was that again? <laughs> again, do I have to remember all this? What if I forget it? Will I look like an idiot halfway through the class when you tell me to adjust the such and such. And I can't even remember what the hell that such and such is. Um, so I, I, I've moved to a much more minimalist sort of, uh, setup, which I literally just say to people, Hey, see these things here. These are the springs. Okay. See the red one. See that one's blue there. I'm going to tell you, put on a red or put on a blue. Okay. Um, whatever in your studio, if it's a half spring or full spring, whatever your, your version of, you know, this is a heavy spring. This is a light spring. Okay. See this one here. That's heavy. See that one there. That's light. Okay. I'm going to tell you, put on two heavy or put on one light or whatever. This is how you do that. And I'll show them, you know, take the spring off, put it on. Here's how you, here's how you put the spring on. Okay. Everything else you need to know as we go, I'm going to show you as we go. Right. So don't worry. If you get confused, I'll be right here. And that's literally all, all I would, that's my total like training at the beginning of class. But how do you, how do you run it for beginners? I teach a fully beginner class, so everybody in the class are beginners. I know that's not true for everybody, uh, not for all of our listeners, but the studio I we, I work at is an all beginner level class, and typically there's a little bit more talking if we have brand new people in class, and we need I need to size them f- for the reformer. So there's a spring bar and a stopper that that um, needs to be placed in the correct position. So if I have a brand new beginner in class, I normally do a very, very quick anatomy of the reformer and just say foot bar, spring bar, here are the color coded springs. Here's your bed. I don't expect you to remember any of these things. We're just going to quickly place the spring bar and your stopper in the right spot. And then we're going to get started and please feel free to ask questions and I will guide you through every exercise because everybody's a beginner. They oftentimes they're really grateful to have that extra review. So I might have a student who's a beginner, but she's had three other classes before this. And she's like, Oh, I don't remember what the red spring is. And I try to make a game out of it too. So if we're doing, let's say arms and straps and I, say to them, put on one red spring. But if you wanted to go lighter, what color would you use? Or if you wanted to go heavier, what color would you use? And uh, we make a game out of it. And that way they get to kind of understand the different spring tensions and what happens where. And one of the things that really, one of the exercises that really shows the how the springs can support you or challenge you is like a down stretch or a long stretch stretch right because a lot of times people think oh well um the lighter the spring maybe the easier the exercise because it's a plank and it's like oh no it's the opposite so it's fun to do those things and kind of make a lesson out of it for them because what i always tell them is you know i just want you to move in class i want you to get to know how to use the machine so that when you move up to the next level you um you know how to use your machine 
because a, a curl up in level one is the same as a curl up in level two, really. Um, the only thing that's probably going to hold you back, at least in my class, is whether or not you know how to switch springs or, you know, where your loops. If, if I say put your loops on your feet, you know how to do that. Otherwise, I really, I mean, um, like I said, the menu is the same. I just have to go a little bit slower for my level one. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't give show people the gear bar or like how to adjust the carriage stopper or the, the travel of the carriage. Essentially, I know on different machines you can adjust maybe the foot bar position or the carriage stopper or the gear bar or all of the above. But um, I just I don't see that as a mission critical. I think like if someone does their first three classes on gear bar setting two when they should be on gear bar setting one, it's like is that really the end of the world? You know, like I think they'll be okay. No. No. Um, I think, you know, if they don't know how to change the springs, I see that as a major obstacle, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, I, you know, I I don't think it's a deal breaker either way, but uh, my personal approach is I just, I, I, I just basically think like, what is the absolute minimum, you know, I could teach this person and for them still to have an enjoyable class, you know. And so I think that's like how to change the springs is really, that's, you know, if you know that, you can do a lot of stuff on a reformer. Um, uh, so yeah, so uh, I think another thing also is positioning and, and pairing up. Um, yeah. So do you have a philosophy on like where to put, where to put people in the room? Yes, I do. We were just talking about Adam and I were just talking about this in a tutorial. Um, I often, so the studio that I work for has a row of reformers and you can see the street. And then you can see the street at the feet of the, the foot of the reformer and you can see it, there's a mirror at the back of the reformer. And my students, my new, new students want to be at the far ends of the room. So they either want to be at the very furthest reformer on one side or the other. And I always say to them, that's fine if you want to do that, but I encourage you to be in the center because when we turn to the side of the reformer, you're going to be at the front of the class and everybody's going to see you. So um, if you don't want to be demoing for the whole class, you're going to want to stick in the middle, I promise. And and just the other day, actually, I had uh, last week, I had a brand new student and I, I placed her next to a friend of mine who was taking beginner level classes. And I just said, hey, this is Allison. Um, she's been taking, a, she's had a bunch of uh, beginner classes under her belt. You, she'll take care of you. So you, you sit next to her. So yeah, I usually keep them in the center of the class. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's awesome. I think the only thing I'd add to that is, uh, yeah, you'll be, you'll be the front of the class when we turn to face the, <laughs> the street. But also, you, you'll have no one in front of you, right? So you, you'll be going like, how the heck do I do this move? I c all I can see is the street, but I can't see anyone else in the class. Whereas if you're in the middle, doesn't matter which, matter which way you're facing, you'll always have someone in front of you that you can copy and sort of follow along with. So I think that's a really, really useful thing. And it actually just makes your job as a trainer so much easier because you don't have to explain everything step by step because the humans are amazing learning machines and we'll just look around and copy what the person next to us is doing, right? So if you just say, hey, everyone, we're going to do the 100, everyone will get into 100, including the beginner, right? The beginner will just go, okay, I see what they're doing. I'm just going to kind of copy along. So, um, and yeah. Well, and logistically for me as the, as the teacher in the class, having them in the center, I typically hug the center of the room. And there have been situations where I've had brand new students at the far end of a room and I'm like, hang on, I'm coming. And I'm running right, to the right. other side to try to help them with something. So hugging the center is a really good idea, both as a you know, for your client and for it, for the teacher, if, if possible, I know sometimes it's not possible in some studios, but it is in mine. I think also what you said about uh, pairing them up with someone. I love that. Uh, I think that that starts to foster a social relationship and that is a massive factor in people sticking with exercise uh, and feeling sort of included in part of the group. Uh, and I, I would even try and do that like before the class, like if they arrive 10 minutes early, I would say, Oh, you know, here's Alison, you know, she's, been coming three months. Allison, you know, this is Mary. Mary, it's Mary's first day today. Can you sort of, can I stick her next to you so she can follow along what you're doing? Um, and I think rather than saying like, can you look after, you know, this person? Because that kind of puts a responsibility on the, the existing clients. Like, no, I'm just here for a workout. Like, I'm not here to, you know, be a mother hen. But but if I just say like, oh, can I put this person next to you so they can just copy along what you're doing? 
I think that doesn't put any really put in really put any like responsibility on that existing client, but it just sort of hopefully pumps up their tires a bit that they're like, oh, you're a good example of you know how to do this right. So, uh, and then then they know each other. You know, they've got someone to talk to. They know each other's name. Next time they come in, they'll be like, oh, hi, Alison, hi, Mary. You know, so um, I think that's I think that's a really good strategy. Um, so in all right, so we you know we've 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 welcomed them in the door. We've identified them to start a class, said, here's how you adjust your springs. Maybe here's how you adjust your gear bar and stopper. Maybe not. Uh, we've sat them down next to somebody who's more experienced, preferably near the center of the group. Um, m- my strategy for as we go along is to then kind of, I think what you basically implied there is basically as I'm curious, so all they know if they're in my class is how to adjust the springs, right? Here's a red spring, here's a blue spring. I'm going to tell you put on a red or a blue. Here's how you do that. Everything else you need to know, I'll tell you as we go. So then as I'm walking around the room and queuing and going, okay, everyone, you've got three and two and one and and rest, and now we're going to go into blah, blah, blah exercise. So put your foot bar down. Okay, I will position myself in anticipation of that instruction next to the beginner. Okay, and as I say, everyone, okay, we're going to go into, I don't know, corkscrew so put your foot bar down okay i would make eye contact with the beginner and i would say as i say put your foot bar down i would put their foot bar down and so i'm teaching them this is how you put the foot bar down this is the foot bar this is down um without giving them a formal lesson and saying hey this is the foot bar this is how you put the foot bar down it's just included in the cue to the group hey everyone we're going to do um corkscrew so put your foot bar down like this Bam, and then, and it might, you know, you might have to do that once or twice for, you know, for that particular adjustment, foot bar down or up or whatever. But then they'll they'll get the hang of it, you know. Um, so I, yeah, same with the loops, right? So put your feet in the loops. It would be like I would never show them that at the starter class. I would position myself. I would go, okay, everyone, you've got three and two and one, and rest. And now we're going to put our feet in the loops for short spine. So. And I would be standing next to the ref- next to the beginner at that point, and I would grab their loops, and I would say, "So put your feet in the loops." And the way you do that is you put this foot, and I would tap their foot on the foot bar, and you put this foot <laughs> in the loop, <laughs> and now you put this foot here, and now you put this foot in this loop. <laughs> Um, and it can really be as quick as it that. It is a process. Yeah. You have to you have to be by your brand new clients. Most of the time, they're like, "I got to do what." <laughs> <laughs> You want me to put my foot where? <laughs> right. But when you're teaching a group where, and, and even if like I've taught beginner classes, but it's a, I've taught a casual beginner class where like, it, yeah, everyone's a beginner, but some people it's their first day and some people it's their fifth day. Right. And so there are some people who, okay, they're still a beginner, but they know how to get in the loops and they know how to do bend and stretch or whatever. Right. And other people are like, what's loops? What's bend and stretch? You know, I don't have a concept of these things. And so when you when you do this strategy of you say, okay, everyone, you know, we, put your feet in the loops or the straps or whatever because we're going to do bend and stretch or frog press or whatever you want to call it, that means the people who know how to do it can get going, right? And they're not stay, or sitting there waiting for you to help this beginner into the move. And, and this is really important because your more regular clients, your existing clients can get really resentful if they see all this like passing parade of beginners coming in, like a revolving door of people coming in for, you know, one or two sessions and then never coming back again, but you're spending, you know, they perceive that you're spending a disproportionate amount of your time with these brand newbies who actually don't pay the bills, right? Because they're coming on on some special intro offer, 10 class for $10 or first class free or whatever. And then there's a paying customer that's on a, like a direct debit membership or they're paying $25 a class, you know, on a, 10 pack or whatever. And you're basically, they, you, they perceive that you're ignoring them because you're always kind of helping out these beginners. Like that's not a good recipe for success for your advanced or more experienced students. So I think you have to, you have to be able to do accommodate both of those people at the same time by saying, Hey everyone, we, we're going to do short spine or bend and stretch or whatever. So put your feet in the loops and get going. Okay. And whilst you say that, you're actually physically helping the beginner into the position and showing them how to do the things, but you're not slowing down the rest of the people while you do that. Yeah, that took me a while to figure that out. And and I don't know if it's because I used to only take classes from instructors who preferred to have people start 
all at the same time. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you been to classes where the teacher's like, nobody move until I say you can move? (laughs) And it took me a while to figure out, I mean, what I typically say, my cue for just about anything, because uh, just for context, I work for a hospital and many people have many different abilities. And so what I end up saying, because some people take a little bit longer to get off the mat than others. And so I will say, uh, come to standing. And for those of you who are are ready and organized, just do some shoulder rolls or do some roll downs, right? And that gives them something to do without twiddling their thumbs um, while the other people are still coming off the mat. And so it's just like, like you said, being comfortable and okay with people getting started, even if it's something simple, like if, Hey, if you've got your feet in the loops, why don't you start with some leg circles while everybody else gets organized? It took me a while to, um, to figure that out. Like, yeah, like get them moving. So they're not just waiting there in space in their resting. I, what is it called? We would be, uh, so the teachers I used to take class from would say, get your feet in the loops and just um, hold them there in your resting angle. Wait while everybody else is getting started. Yeah, no, that's not fun. That's boring. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> like, well, speaking is, I'm usually the fast person in the room. So I'd be like sitting there just lying there going, oh, this is fucked. Like, you know, just because someone else takes like three minutes to get their feet in the loops, why should I be penalized? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Like, um, yeah, so I think that's a real skill. And I think that is a big part of, of the skill of working with different levels of ability is managing those transitions from one exercise to another so that people who work at different speeds, who move at different speeds, who are, you know, pick, who learn at different speeds can all work at their own preferred speed and, you know, let not the quick wait for the slow, but also let not the slow be penalized. And so, you know, if you, if it takes you a minute and a half to get your feet in the loops, that's cool. And if it takes you four seconds and you want to get going, that's cool too. Yeah. And the way we can achieve that is just, is just by calling, just call out the name of the exercise, right? Hey, we're going to do short spine. So whack on two red springs, put your feet in the loops and get going. If you know how to do that, if you don't know how to do that, here's how you, here's how you do that. Yeah. There's a compromise when you're in a group class, part of the, um, part of the, compromise is that there are going to be people who are working at different speeds and everybody's got to just be okay with everybody. So the people who are really fast need to learn a little bit of patience and the people who are really, really slow um, can practice getting a little bit faster. Right. And I think, you know, there's probably like some degree of, uh, like you say, kind of like tolerance required. Like if I take four seconds, then I have to wait six more seconds. It's probably not going to kill me. Um, But if I take four seconds and I have to wait another like two minutes that, you know, out of a 45 minute session, I'm going to feel resentful (laughs) about that. Yeah. Um, uh, And I think, you know, for those people who are less able, you can just physically help them get into the position. You can hand them the straps, you can give them, help them with their balance. You know, you can go get the box for them, you know, whatever it might be. Um, All right. So we've, we've welcomed them. We've showed them how to do the super most basic adjustments on the reformer. We've said, don't worry, everything else you need to know, I'll be right here. I'll help you. I'll do it with you. I'll do it for you. You will not be alone. We've positioned them next to Jane in the middle of the room um, and told them just copy everything Jane does. Uh, and then basically as we're teaching, we we and if, anytime we're coming up to some kind of equipment adjustment or position change that we think requires more than zero explanation, we basically position ourselves next to that person in anticipation so that as we give the instruction to the group to, okay, now get ready for a long stretch, so put your foot bar up, we are in fact physically doing the thing that we're instructing, saying here's how you put your foot bar up, but we're not literally saying that. We're just main, making eye contact and then going, doing a kind of slightly exaggerated <laughs> version of putting your foot bar up. <laughs> So that they can say, okay, this is what I mean when I say put the foot bar up. Uh, uh, all right. And so what about um, like, you know, so what about the question that we talked about at the start, the elephant, okay? So how much intensity, how much intensity should we, how much load should we give a beginner? 
Well, I think that's one of the things that takes a little bit of practice because depending on the exercise, let's go with footwork because footwork is really easy. Um, at my studio, the typical spring setting is, I think, two yellows and a red, which is actually like just under three full springs. Um, that's really easy. It's easy for me now because I'm used to the Australian people who are like, three full springs, maybe more, maybe all. <laughs> In our defense, the the Joseph Pilates setting was three full springs. Yeah. Okay. In your defense. <laughs> um, anytime I pick an exercise, I try I, I try really hard to pick something that I think every single person in the room can be successful with. And then it's a matter of just kind of watching and seeing. I mean, there are going to be some people who I know right away. I have one um, student in my class. He uh, he is very, very strong. So I'm always calling out to him, tack on another one if you want, because I know that you could probably handle it. But for my beginner students, I, I usually start with a standard spring setting. And I say to them, this is what we typically do. You can absolutely... Um, go more or less, but let's try this here at this level. And then let's do 10. And depending on how you're doing, we might need to adjust the springs. But with any exercise, with any load setting, I try to pick something that I think is going to be representative of everybody in my group. Hopefully they all can do it. That's the goal is to get them successful with the first exercise and then adjust from there stick around long enough in that exercise to uh, experiment and, and play around a bit. Yeah. Agreed. I'm, I'm with you. I don't know if that really answered, but uh, yeah, no, well, I think it, I think it's, it's most of an answer in my view. The other thing is like how close to failure do you get them? Um, which can be a separate question to how much load you put on. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I agree. Like, you know, load them up, uh, not ridiculously, but just load them up. So they're like, Oh yeah, this is hard work. You know, that's, that's that's what we're going for. But um, I would say I don't want to get those people very close to failure, very close to fatigue. I don't necessarily want to get them a burn um, in their first maybe like two weeks because uh, they will experience DOMS and DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, if you're listening to this, I'm pretty sure you've already experienced that at some point in your life. Maybe you've got it right now. Uh, and it, it it is a result of unaccustomed exercise, especially eccentric exercise where you're in the lengthening phase. So footwork, you know, less so, but something like long stretch where you're stretching out or like legs in straps where you're doing like leg circles or side splits or front splits or Russian splits or rocking or like you know, I'm not that you do rocking with a beginner, but like basically anything where you're lengthening, say, all right, so rocking is probably not a good example, but say round back where you're working the abs, but you, you're lengthening the abs as you go backwards over the box. Um, and so like anything that's basically an unaccustomed eccentric contraction, that is like what number one thing that's going to result in more DOMS. And so what I'm thinking with a beginner is I basically want to avoid getting them near failure and I want to avoid like unaccustomed eccentric contractions. If we do those, like I would do front splits and side splits with a beginner, but I would stop them like well short of fatigue because even though if you feel fine right now, I don't want you to wake up tomorrow morning and not be able to get out of bed because you can't move your legs, you know? So just because that would be like super unpleasant and you'll think like, oh, fuck this for a joke, Pilates, you know, hurts. And um, why would I put myself through this? <laughs> I can't see why people enjoy it. <laughs> So I want them to wake up tomorrow morning going, oh, that was awesome. <laughs> I feel so great. <laughs> um, and so because DOMS is uh, mostly triggered by an unaccustomed bout of eccentric exercise, as you become accustomed to it, the same exercise causes less and less DOMS. And eventually, for a lot of people, causes no DOMS just because it's accustomed. And we're not quite sure of the actual physiological mechanism of why that happens. It's called the repeated bout effect, where you basically get less and less sore when you just do the same workout. You just become accustomed to it. Um, but this could be somebody who's like, like you were saying, I can't remember if it was on air or off air, but it, somebody who's maybe like a weightlifter who's like incredibly strong at lifting weights, but they've never done Pilates before. Well, they might come and they could do footwork with all the springs on with one leg easily, right? But give them front splits and then probably have DOMS for like five days afterwards, right? Because it's unaccustomed. They're not used to doing 
that even though they've got strong muscles, it's an unaccustomed form of exercise. So, um, and this is, applies to your regular clients when they come back from a break as well, right? If they've been ill or if they've been on holiday, uh, you know, Christmas or whatever, and they come back like they're going to get DOMS unless you really take it easy on those eccentric exercises, those lengthening contraction you know, splits and back bends and things like that. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I would definitely, uh, you know, be very conservative on those ones. And if I had a whole group of beginners, I would teach those very, very sparingly. And if I just had a couple of beginners in a more mixed group, I would say that I would give the beginners a much lighter, like load, whether that's a heavier spring or a lighter spring, but I'll give them like less, less load to work against. And I would probably say to them, Hey, I might give them like a layer. So you start with your knees down on this one, please. Um, et cetera. Uh, or I might even say, like, I, I want you to just do five reps of this today, and I know you might be able to feel like you can do more, but you'll thank me tomorrow when you can still cough and laugh without, you know, crying. <laughs> That's so funny. I feel like I'm speaking for the vast majority of Pilates practitioners. I love DOMS. I really do. Huh. But that's that's the thing is that you can become, you know, people can become addicted to that feeling, right? Because we associate that with getting stronger and all the benefits that we get from Pilates. But when you feel it for the first time, like imagine if, you know, and this this is again, like you said at the start, the curse of knowledge. Like if you're someone who's literally not exercised in 25 years, right? And then you go and do a workout and you get like hella doms for that last for like five days afterwards, it's like, that is not a fun experience, I think, for right. most well, people. Right. Well, and I agree. Well, and I've worked with people too coming right out of surgery, um, not right out of surgery, but in rehab where their nervous system is really s sensitive. And so even not even DOMS, we're talking about just like muscle burning during an exercise. And the, you know, I've had students really freak out uh, because it's been, it had been so long since they used, you know, that particular joint or muscle. Um, and that, that is definitely something that I think about too, is just making sure that their nervous system systems don't go out of whack by doing really crazy things. Like, I mean, I suppose if you, if you want to get rid of a brand new student, then teach them rocking yeah. on the long box <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with minimal well, cueing. That would, that would get rid of a lot of, a lot of non-brand new students as well. I know. Like, like we, maybe we could do an episode on like, here are the exercises that basically no one enjoys, like horseback, rocking. <laughs> um, what a, what a, what's another one? Um, I don't know. Like this, there's some people that like, maybe there are other ones that are more like love, hate, but like high bridge. I would love to do high bridge. I just can't do it the way that Haley does it. I would love to do breaststroke. I can't do it the way probably Haley does it. Yeah. Well, I would love to do it as well. <laughs> yeah. But, but given my current physical abilities, it freaking sucks. My, one of my least favorite reformer exercises is, um, is it called, do you call it tree? We, do we call it tree? Yeah, I, tree, tree on the short box. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I had a student once, um, in a class and he said to me, can we never, ever again do ants on a log? He meant tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ants on a log that's it. i'm going to call it that for now on i can see and the ants climb up the log and then the ants climb down the log yeah, yeah. um all right so yeah so i think it's i i personally think it's it's very valuable to keep it to mild to moderate intensity and by intensity i really mean like proximity to failure um and also uh, be very sparing with eccentric work where they're strengthening and stretching at the same time, um, like your splits and, uh, you know, round back on the short box and stuff like that. Um, but definitely, you know, give them, you know, close to, if not the normal load that you would give everybody else, you know. Um, but I think there's, I, I, I don't, you know, see any convincing argument for teaching people to stabilize before you load them up. Uh, I think that's a, mis a mistaken approach. I think there's, you know, I understand why people do it. I used to do it. Um, 
the idea is that you don't, if you don't have good biomechanics, if you don't have good stability and correct muscle activation, then when you load that body part, you know, it'll activate incorrectly or won't be stabilized or the little muscles won't be strong enough to hold the joint in the right place while the big muscles move it around. It turns out though that all of those theories have been examined um, scientifically and shown to not be true you know the predictions that they make don't come true so when we load people without stabilizing them they don't get injured they don't get pain they don't get dysfunction um uh, they just get strong (laughs) and it turns out that the little muscles uh that are the stabilizer muscles um although that's a whole nother conversation maybe there's not even such a thing as stabilizer muscles but the little muscles let's say um if they are working in a stabilizing role well when you load the big muscles the little muscles have to work to stabilize. So you, when you load the big muscles, you also load the little muscles, right? So the the notion that you can load the big muscles or the little muscles is a false dichotomy. Uh, when you like, you can load all of the muscles all at the same time. In fact, you always load all of the muscles <laughs> at the same time. Anytime you load your, you know, hip flexors, you load your transversus. Anytime you load your deltoid in your shoulder, you load your rotator cuff. Anytime you load your you know, glutes, you load your deep rotators in the hip. Like, you know, there is no kind of like separate, act, you don't need to do separate activation drills for these muscles. Uh, and I don't want to have a necessarily a big long conversation about that uh, because I think we've talked about it. Like I think we've got an episode in, on scapular stability a little while back. We've got a, a few episodes on like core activation and stuff like that. Um, but really there is, um, you know, this is a notion that I used to hold. And if you currently are doing that, dear listener, you know, no, uh, you know, we're not casting, um, you know, stones at you because we've lived in that glass house ourselves. Um, but it turns out that, uh, there is no benefit in terms of injury prevention or even just movement efficiency to teaching like stabilization or biomechanics before you just start loading people up. Because when you just load people up uh, progressively, you know, you start at a load they can manage and then gradually build it up over time, their their nervous system, just their premotor cortex just figures it out and becomes more efficient and the movement gets more graceful and better organized and their muscles activate as they need to. And all that happens just in a marvelous symphony that is purely non-conscious. You know, it's like cats or you know, whatever, like they don't need to think about which muscles activate. They just, and that's humans are the same. Like we've got basically the same brain as a cat, same nervous system as a cat. And, you know, we can learn non-consciously as well. It doesn't mean we're not learning, you know, just because you can't like consciously recite which muscles you're working doesn't mean, you know, you're not using the right muscles. Cats can't recite which muscles they're using, but they can still, you know, <laughs> do amazing things with their bodies. So, Consciously knowing a thing and being able to do it are just not the same thing. So training people up on you know how to activate certain muscles or blah 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 just doesn't basically doesn't help. There's no benefit to it. All all we're doing when we do that is basically delaying people from from reaping the benefits of loading. Right when you load, you get all these incredible benefits to you know strength. Uh, and uh, health and longevity and blood pressure and mental health and cognitive function and like disease prevention and like we could go on and on and on and on and on about the health benefits of strength training. In fact, if you do, if you load all of your muscles to point of near failure, like twice a week, you reduce your chance of dying by any cause in the next ten years by forty four percent. You know, like so that is an incredible benefit. And if we're you know, it's, if we make somebody spend like four weeks learning how to activate their whatever muscle or stabilize their whatever body part before we allow them to load, we're delaying that benefit by four weeks. You know, I think I think it's once you know, it's not ethical to do that. I think we're, it's our job to to encourage people to load. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I think um when I started teaching beginners the when I was a beginner teacher teaching beginners, I felt like I, I had a huge laundry list of priorities 
that I needed to cram into one session. And that included things like stability protocol and alignment protocols and safety protocols. And what I ended up finding was that I was, what were your, what were your words? Overloading my students mentally and underloading them physically. That's what I was doing. And the comment that I got all the time, and I, it forced me to really have to th- rethink my strategy with working with beginners is they, they would say to me all the time, it's so much, it's so much information. I'm, I'm, it's too much, it's too much to remember. And I thought, oh, I gotta, I gotta change this. Like, this is not working for me. And, and that was the first, that was the first thing that I changed in my style of teaching was I need to cut back on my priority list on my agenda with my beginner clients. So really we're just going to work on getting moving and getting you to love Pilates. And then we'll worry about everything later, everything else later. And I still, you know, there's still a, a lot of students who come to my class and they have taken beginner classes from other teachers and they'll say things like we, we only worked on breath. We worked on like breathing and we did a little bit of stretching <clears throat> and maybe we did a little bit of footwork and then of course, of course they come to my class and I'm like, go grab some weights, throw your skate, uh, your skating platform on. We're going to, we're going to get going. They're like, we're doing what, what are we doing? And it's like, yeah, we got to get going. Let's get going. Um, and I just find that, you know, like we got to give our students more credit than, than, than what perhaps maybe we've been traditionally told. They, they know their bodies. They know their limits. I just, I, it's really, I think really important to not to just let them move because I think the other side of it too, Raph is like when we're talking to them about, if we are talking to them about stability is that that lends itself to a bit of fear and questioning about, am I doing this right? Am I stable? And we don't want that. Like we, I want my students to feel brave about tacking on another spring or taking off a spring and maybe try this time with your knees off. Um, that's really important to me. And I always say to my students, if you look like you're doing it perfectly, it tells me that it's too easy. So we're going to do it harder next time. Like, I don't want you to look perfect. I want you to, I want you to shake and I want you to, you know, like look like you're, you're really working hard. Um, cause if you look perfect, that means it's not hard enough. <laughs> here, here. Uh, but for beginners, I would keep it, I would try and I know you weren't talking about beginners, but for beginners, I would probably avoid, you know, like once we get to the shaking point, I'll be like, okay, that's enough for you um, for today. Um, All right. So I think uh, you're talking about challenge and hard and all of that. Uh, You did say at the start in terms of motivation and the optimal theory is about giving them wins, right? So we want to we want them to feel successful. And so when we, you know, and this is just basic kind of, as well as being good um, practice for actually improving their skill quickly, it actually just enhances motivation. Like if you go along and try ballroom dancing and you suck at it, you know, you're constantly stepping on people's feet and no one wants to dance with you on account of that. It's like, you're much less likely to go, oh, that was awesome fun. I'm going to go back again next week, right? Whereas if you have like a string of partners complimenting you on how good you are and are you sure you've never done this before, like you'll be like, oh, this is, this is fun. You know, I'm good at this. And you'll be much more likely to go back next week. And so it's the same with with most things I think that humans try is like if we feel like, oh, I'm a natural at this, it's much easier to get motivated and, and get excited about doing it because you can see yourself getting really good. So um I think, you know, and that's, we know that from optimal theory as well, that, that people are more motivated when they perceive that they have a high likelihood of success. They, they try harder and they persist longer, um, which is what they want, what we want them to do, right? So we want them to try harder and persist longer because then they'll get the benefits and then they'll, they'll experience those euphoric moments and they'll, they'll become addicted, <laughs> uh, in a good yeah. way. Yeah. One thing that I find really helpful with the optimal theory, especially in terms of Pilates is that I think sometimes in Pilates, we really believe that you need to perfect something before you can do something else. Mm. That's the way that I was taught. You know, mm. if you're really good at a knee fall, a bent knee fallout, 
then maybe you can straighten your knee a little bit more than, mm, you know, mm, if you're mm. really good at double toe taps, maybe we can move on to teaser. Um, and that was the way that I was raised in my early Pilates mm, years. But mm. I think the way that I like to apply optimal theory in terms of the confidence part is if you set the bar low and you get them feeling really good about something, anything, just doing something approximately right. It's just, you just create such a better relationship with your student and they begin yeah. to trust you and they begin to be brave and they, they, they listen to you when you do give them a correction or, or feed or critical feedback. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I try to remember all the time, especially working with beginners, but this is true for any of my clients is, encourage more than correct. And actually there's a way to do both at the same time. Adam does this really well. I'm sure Haley does this too. I'm talking about breathe trainers, but um, the idea of saying something like, Hey Raph, I love the way that you're reaching toward your toes. I wonder if you can reach just a little bit further, right? So it's like you're giving them a compliment, but at the same time, you're trying to get them to do a little bit more. And I think um, the way we do it at Breathe, the way we try to get our teachers and training to create this, this really rewarding learning environment for our, our clients is really, really ingenious. Because oftentimes, well, at least the way that I was trained is like, you need to correct them because when you correct your students, you're giving them attention. But I feel like oftentimes the correction just becomes really negative or it just it's kind of it's embarrassing like to be called out like that. And I've definitely had experiences where in the past I've adjusted or corrected students and they really, really take offense. They did not like it. I mean, as soon as I would approach them, they'd just tense up because they knew I was going to point out something that they did wrong. And I did. I pointed something out wrong instead of just catching them doing something right. There's um, what's I'm going to refer to a book that you sent all of us. It was the one minute manager. In that book, um, uh, the author says, I wrote it down. So he, he says, catch them doing something approximately right until they eventually learn to do it all the way right. I love that because that is so true with all human beings, but especially for beginner students who are doing really complicated things. Like I think we forget that, you know, we're asking human beings to get on this weird machine and then do weird things on this machine. And we forget that it's, it's not second nature. So being able to just praise them, just like, Hey, we're so glad, we're so glad you made it in here. Look at you doing this really funky thing. This is awesome. Mm. Yeah, I think so. In the so, I think there are two strategies there that you've outlined. One is setting the bar low, and the other is um, uh, uh, catching them doing things right. And so, an example of that, if we stick with footwork, would be, you know, not giving them like highly specific instructions on exactly where their feet go. You know, Pilates V, heels, arches, toes, whatever. Um, uh, just saying like, hey, put your foot on the foot bar here and like give a good whack on the foot bar. And this is the foot bar. Put your feet on this thing. Okay, press out. Okay, come in. Great. Are you sure this is your first Pilates class? Like, well, usually you don't have people pick this up so quickly on their first day. Um, have you have you danced? Um, are you a gymnast? Um, yeah. So things like that, where like your standard, your your the standard they have to to achieve in order for you to go, oh, you're doing this so well is like, is really low. Okay. So if, if your feet are on the bar and your back is on the carriage and the carriage is moving in and out, that is an A plus, you know, I don't care if one foot's got the heel on, the other foot's got the toe on, one leg's turned in, one leg's turned out, your knees are hyperextending, your knees are not fully extending, the carriage is jerking, what, I don't care, right? If the carriage is moving in and out, your feet are on the bar and it's your first day, you win, you know? You get it. You get a candy cane, <laughs> um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna literally make a fuss of people and say like, are you sure this is your first day? Like, you know, <laughs> what what are you are you a dancer? Um, and uh, then you can then give them the next layer, which so these things like catch them doing something right, and then 
also seeing the bar low, these things work together, right? So if, if you if you make the definition of right like really loose, <laughs> right? So if you if you're basically on the reformer facing in the correct direction and the reformer's moving, you're doing it right. Okay. Well, then you can catch them doing something right really easily. Okay. And then you can give them the next level and tell them, look, I don't usually progress people this fast. Okay. But I'm going to give you the next layer of this because you're doing so well. Okay. So you're like pumping up their tires like a maniac. And you go, okay. So the next layer is you put your feet here and your heels together and your toes apart. Okay. Whoa. You just picked that up just like that. That's amazing. Keep going. Right. So rather than giving them that all of that information in one big kind of like mind dump, um, just giving them like the bare, 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 what's the, what's the least they could do and still be like basically doing footwork? You know, what's the, what's the bare, bare minimum definition of the exercise? You know, if it's long stretch, right? If your hands are on the bar and your feet or knees are on the carriage and you're pushing in and out, you're doing it. You know, now just say you're all twisted and your hands are uneven, your feet are uneven, your bum's poking up in the air and you're looking up and you're looking down and everything's going weird and wonky. It's still basically doing it. You know, you win. High five. You sure this is your first day? That's amazing. Next level for you. I don't usually progress people this fast because, but because you're doing so well, the next level for you is see how your bum's poking up in the air here. Let's get your bum down in between your head and your knees. Amazing. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. I think for me as a teacher, it took me a minute to figure out I don't have to teach them how to do it perfectly on the first class because the goal is for them to keep coming back forever and we can keep adding refinements and challenges. And it, yeah, there's no hurry. Let them, you know, as long as their forehead is not on the bar and their hands are on the bar, that's long stretch. Like it's all right. 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 Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, longish, longish stretch. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, all right. So, set the bar low, and that that could mean giving them actually just like a really low fidelity version of what good looks like. Like if your feet are on the bar and your body's in the carriage, and the carriage is moving in and out, you're winning. Okay. Or it could actually just look like giving them an easier version of the exercise. Right. So we give them, I don't know, uh, front splits. Okay. But we give it to them with their back knee on the carriage and their front foot on the floor and their hands on the footbar. And we go, here's front splits. OMG, you're amazing. I don't see a lot of people pick this up on their first day. You know, that's incredible. And now I give you, I'm going to give you a harder version because this is too easy for you now, right? After seven reps, you're amazing. So why don't you lift your back knee up off the carriage now and straighten this leg out here for me? Okay. And let's see how you go with that. Wow, that's incredible. You're doing great. So you can actually just give them an easier version of the exercise and then progress the version. So you could give them an easier version of of the of the cue, you know, an easier, less precise, you know, bar to jump over, to clear, to feed, to get your praise. Or you can also, slash and, you can give them just actually literally like a lighter spring, smaller range of motion, more points of contact on the ground or the carriage or whatever. You can just make it literally easier for them to succeed by giving them an easier exercise. So instead of doing like bird dog with opposite arm and leg, how about just the arm or just the leg, you know? Uh, All right. So I think we're just about there, but um, what about uh, at the end? Okay. What about at the end of class? What do you, what, how do you, how do you arrange things there? Do you have special things you do for beginners at the end of class? I just like to be present for my, uh, for my students, all of my students, but especially the beginners, they oftentimes have a lot of questions or they'll have a lot of, they'll have a lot to say like, oh my God, I've never, I never thought I would be doing something like this. And, and that's just another opportunity for me to create a relationship and a connection with them to reassure them that they did an amazing job. Um, at my studio, they need to take a certain amount of beginner level classes before they can move up to level two. So oftentimes, you know, if, if, um, because it's my last class of the day, I have plenty of time to be available to them and to just give them all of the stuff that they wanted to talk about that we didn't have a chance to talk about or that I chose not to talk about during class because I wanted to get them moving right away. Like here's the gear bar and stuff like that or? 
Yeah. Or, or they might say something like when I was doing this, um, when I was doing feet and straps, I really felt it. Um, I really felt it a lot in my lower back. And I was just wondering if that's dangerous because, you know, I've had some low back issues and that's just a place for me to be like, Oh, well, let me tell you about <laughs> what I think Pilates can do for you and, <laughs> and your low back. Um, yeah. So sometimes I, I'll have a few students who want to know about their, um, their medical conditions. Um, and then I have a few students who want to know about like, what do I need to do to move up to level two or, you know, to more, uh, more an intermediate class. And, um, yeah, I love the end of class because that to me is where the therapeutic relationship really gets solid because I'm just there. I'm there for anything that they need and to just keep, laying it on thick that I just thought that they did amazing. I think that's one of the things that I, that it took me a long time to understand that they needed that for me, that they needed to be reassured that they did well. And I don't know where that comes from. If they were just, if their idea of Pilates is just stuff that they see on Instagram where everybody's beautiful and perfect and they're not feeling that. Um, but yeah. What do you do for the end of class? Uh, similar. Um, I really, really like to make eye contact and thank every person as they walk out. So I usually, I usually like if I've used a prop in the class, like a ball or a hand weight or a circle or a band or whatever, uh, I will hold the basket and I'll stand at the door as everyone walks out and I'll say, hey, just pop your thingy in the basket on the way out. Uh, and then I can say thank you. I can make eye contact and I say, can say you did great today. Uh, you know, looking forward to seeing you again next week, you know, those kinds of things. And I, I really make a massive effort. I'm terrible with names by by inclination, but I make a massive effort to to memorize people's names. And I pretty much always succeed in, in memorizing people's names by the end of class. And my strategy for that is I just basically look on the booking app, whether it's Acuity or Mind Body or whatever, as they sign in, I like look at their name and they'll look at their face and I'm like, okay, that name belongs with that face. <laughs> okay. I've even gone to the length of actually asking people's permission and taking photos of them. So like, just so I can put your name and your face together on this app here. And mind body has that facility. Um, uh, and then, then I just make a point of using their name, right? Like through the class, then that helps to me remember it. Um, and if I forget, I just ask. Um, uh, and I find that people are totally fine with that. Anyway, so I'd, I like to really make an effort to make eye contact and personally thank and use the name of every person as they walk out. Um, and also I think for beginners, there are two things that I like to add in. One of which is just to give them a little heads up about DOMS. You know, so you may be, you know, because this is your first, you know, first day, you may feel a bit sore tomorrow or even the next day and in your muscles. Um, uh, and don't worry, that's completely normal. And that doesn't, continue right that is a that is a phenomenon that happens when you start exercise but it, it fades away very quickly so after your second or third class you probably won't have that anymore so all you need to do is just keep coming regularly and that will that will you know disappear over time uh, and the second thing is i like to tell them how often and when to come back uh, so rather than sort of leaving it up to them because they you know presumably don't know thing number one about exercise and therefore can't really have a informed opinion about how often they should be doing Pilates. You know, I mean, ideally you would have had a, like an onboarding conversation with them where you would have talked about their goals and their, you know, all of that stuff. But if, if you're working in, if you're working in a more kind of high volume studio where you've got like 15 people in the room and it's just like, okay, five of them are new and you don't have time to <laughs> sit down with every person one-on-one, -on -one, I would just say to them, Hey, look, I would, I would love to see you back, you know, twice a week or once a week, both will, both will get you results. Twice a week will give you faster results. Okay. But once a week is a minimum. If you come less than once a week, you're not going to, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get stronger. You're not going to get more flexible. You're not going to get all of those health benefits. So I would love to see you back at a minimum next Tuesday, but preferably on Friday. Yeah. And so I just, yeah, I just tell them like, here's when, here's when you should come back. That's a good strategy. Um, there's one thing that uh, I, I've, uh, we didn't talk about and which I just want to sort of give an honorable mention to, which is like during class when, when you have a beginner, I think you kind of alluded to it before is like, it can feel super weird on a reformer. And also like when you said, like someone's coming back from, um, 
surgery or whatever, it can feel super weird and overwhelming when they just have the sensations of their muscles just actually working, right? That can be like, holy cow. I've got this weird sensation in my muscles. What is it? It's like, you know, that's called exercise. <laughs> yeah. I've actually had to say that to somebody. Right. I've seen people on the first day doing footwork with this like incredulous expression on their face, like, holy heck, what the, <laughs> what the? And I'm like, yeah, no, that's normal. Just keep pushing. You can do it. You know, <laughs> like you can feel this in your thighs now, right? They're like, yes. I'm like, that's good. That means you're doing it right. <laughs> So just normalizing those sort of uncomfortable, unpleasant, unfamiliar sensations that are just the normal part of exercising. Like when you're doing the 100, your abs hurt. That is That means you're doing it right. Okay. When you're doing footwork, you can feel your thighs. That means you're doing it right. <laughs> and so just like, just normalizing that. Hey, you're feeling this in your thighs right now, right? Yeah, that that's normal. Everyone else is too. Don't worry. That's, that's correct. <laughs> that's, this is what it's meant to feel like. <laughs> Yeah, I think what I've normalized quite a bit, because I think when people feel their abs or maybe they feel their butt or their thighs, they're like, oh yeah, I'm feeling my abs, I'm feeling my butt. But the thing that I have to normalize the most would be things like neck, wrists, neck, abs, sometimes abs. toes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a, a lot that, that happens a lot with my beginners. Actually, it happens a lot with a lot of my clients, but with beginners, especially it's like, oh, my neck. And I'm like, I know, right? Like your neck has muscles just like anywhere else. And it's just going to, it will get stronger. Take breaks, take breaks if you need to. But um, the more you yeah. practice, the the stronger it'll get. Same thing with wrists. Great, great point. And uh, that is something I do too. And uh, thanks for, thanks for bringing it up. And shout out to Anula Myberg, uh, wrist, uh, neck abs. Neck abs, Anula Myberg, yes. I mean, Anula Myberg, she, there's so many things. I was just talking, I was talking with, I think it was Heath about something Anula Myberg said. And I said, uh, Anula Myberg said, and I just felt <laughs> just like, oh, I was quoting her about something else, something that she said in the <laughs> podcast. Uh, one of the things that we didn't mention during class that I think is extremely important for beginners is using external cueing, by the way. Huh. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about that for uh, a moment. Just the, the, you know, so when I when I was trained in my first training, there was a lot of internal cueing, and I found so often that people are like, "What what is my glute?" Or you know, like I would use the word, I would use glute, or I'd say, you know, like feel your scapula, and they're like, "My what?" And so it's just when you use internal cues. Not to say that internal cues are bad. There's a place for them, but when you use internal cues with beginners, you're assuming that they know what you're talking about. And I have just found that using external cueing, especially with beginners, I 99% of my cues with beginners are external cues because it's just so much more efficient for me and for them to be able to say, look up at the ceiling um, or, you know, look toward the floor or point your point your straps toward the ceiling, just to be able to use external cues, it just goes by faster. And I can say this just from experience, like the say, if I cue an exercise, I should probably do an experiment. If I cue an exercise with just internal cueing and then cue the same exercise with just external cueing, I, I am confident. I'm 100% confident I get more success with external cueing. Well, that's, that's what the science says. And of course, uh, internal cueing is where you are, giving cues like verbal instructions or imagery or whatever that brings the client's attention to a point inside their body. So if you're saying, hey, activate your XYZ muscle or become aware of the sensation in your blah, blah, blah body part, uh, those are internal cues. Whereas external cues bring their attention to a point outside their body that's related to the result of the movement. So like push the carriage out, lift the straps to the ceiling, move the carriage quietly, press the back of your t-shirt into the, into the carriage, you know, that kind of thing. Um, those are external cues. And so usually we can use the equipment uh, or clothing um, as and the, the surroundings in the room, the environment, you know, reach towards the, the front wall, uh, look at the door, you know, turn to face the windows, um, those kinds, you know, reach the straps towards the side wall, those kinds of things are really uh, effective cues for enhancing learning. And there is just a freaking mountain of evidence uh, on this and it is it is it is effective for beginners it is effective for intermediate it's effective for advanced students it's effective for athletes it's effective for stroke uh, sorry not for stroke survivors it's effective in musculoskeletal rehab 
Uh, and yeah, so there's there is just a huge number of situations where it's where it's effective. And like you say, there are a couple of situations where internal cues are better. So one is in stroke rehab, uh, and there's an argument for it in bodybuilding. Although I think it's not a very cogent argument, uh, but I don't want to get into that <laughs> whole conversation now. But uh, yeah, external cues talking about. You know, you're basically using the equipment and the surroundings as frame of reference and orienting people's, giving people instructions that get them to move the equipment in a certain direction or, you know, speed or height or, or whatever it might be. Um, as opposed to, you know, activate your, you know, deep abdominals or your butt or your whatever it might be because a lot of people like don't really know how to do that or even where what deep abdominals are or yeah and yeah i i I don't know how to do that (laughs) right and 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 training them in how to do that has no earthly purpose there is no like you know, learning to selectively activate muscles is a skill. You can learn it. You know, some people can like, uh, you know, wiggle their ears, right? And I'm pretty sure that that's a learnable skill. Like if you like, if you can't wiggle your ears, right? If you went and got some coaching and practiced like an hour a day for six months, I reckon you'd probably be able to wiggle your ears, right? It's a, it's a skill that you can learn. And in the same way, we know from heaps of research that you can learn, people can learn to selectively activate their transversus abdominis or their multifidus or their whatever. Um, and so that is a learnable, teachable skill. Uh, but uh, people who are better at activating the transverse abdominis don't have less back pain or fewer injuries or greater movement efficiency or anything like that. So there's no, it's like, yes, you could teach them to do that. Well, could you teach them to do it without an ultrasound machine? I don't know. It's debatable. But even just saying, assuming you could teach them to do it, why? There's no, there's no actual benefit to it. There's no actual benefit. And in fact, I would argue that there's a, there's a detriment to teaching them how to do that because whilst they're lying there palpating their ASIS and, and breathing and thinking of their transverse abdominis, they're not loading, right? They're not getting those unbelievable benefits of strength training, which involve like life extension, better mental health, you know, better functional capacity in day-to-day life, fewer chronic diseases, less cancer, less diabetes, less, less um, uh, Alzheimer's, you know, like amazing benefits. And so you miss out on a lot on all of that if you're not actually loading people because those benefits accrue when you do resistance training, which is defined as bringing all major muscles to a point of near fatigue, right? So if you do that twice a week, you, you get all those, you know, most of those benefits happen when you do that twice a week on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, but, you know, selectively activating transverse abdominis essentially has zero health benefit and doesn't prevent or or uh, or alleviate back pain any more than just doing any other exercise. And if you do a, a loaded exercise, you not only alleviate your back pain, but you also get freaking stronger, <laughs> and you get you get better mental health, and you live longer, and you all of those things. So so um, yeah, I think there is no good argument for activating transverse abdominis. It's funny. Like, it's so funny that in Pilates, this has become such a sticky, sticky idea that it's like, it's so ingrained in in the Pilates community. But what is ironic to me about that is it's not from Joseph Pilates. This is not, like, Joseph Pilates specifically says, Pilates is not, or Contrology, he said, is not for the, merely for the development of this or that pet set of muscles. Instead, it's for the whole uniform development of the body as a whole. You know, he's, he's designed this system of whole body movements, you know, loaded whole body movements by and large, like Contrology is very vigorous. The way Joseph taught Pilates was very vigorous and like very integrating the whole body and limbs. There's no like, you know, these kind of knee folds and pelvic curls, like that, none of that came from Joseph Pilates. (laughs) He he was all about planks and push ups and pikes and <laughs> handstands and all you know, splits and back bends and all kinds of like wrestlers bridges. He was all about vigorous exercise, right? And in this regard, his like science has proved him to be a genius, you know, fifty years ahead of his time, 
that, and yet it's so weird that we've got this sort of tra- obsession with transverse abdominis and pelvic floor and stuff. Joseph never mentions any of that. It's like it never mentions it. And all of that stuff only came in in the 1990s and early 2000s. Joseph Platy's died in 1962, you know, and yet we, for some reason, we, we just view these, you know, things like cueing pelvic floor and muscle activation is like just so deeply inherent to Pilates. It's not, it's not part of Pilates. Yeah. It's just, we just added it in, in the 1990s. Well, and when we're talking about teaching beginners too, and we're asking beginners to operate a machine to get them to focus on their muscles, takes their focus away from everything else. It's like my, my kid is learning how to drive right now. And You know, if I told him, I want you to focus on how hard you're gripping the steering wheel and make sure that you kind of set your core while (laughs) while you're pressing the gas pedal, like he would get into an accident. And I see this a lot. I saw this a lot when I was teaching Pilates and trying to teach muscle activation is, you know, I'm telling them, you know, move this bar, move this spring, and I want you to really feel your muscle. And they're just like, "Uh, I can't do all those things at the same time. And it's true. They can't. I shouldn't expect them to do it. And I feel like when you're when you're um, asking people to bring focus to one thing, it comes at a cost of something else. So it really just as a teacher, you got to decide, you know, what is it that you want people to focus on? Because they can really only focus probably on one thing at a time. And do we really want them to focus on the. On the yeah. Like what a, what a, what a great uh, what a great illustration. Like when you I mean, if you're learning a complex task like typing. Right. And, or playing the flute or something like that. Something that's complex motor task. And then if you were like sipping a cup of tea and I asked you to savor and tell me like, what are the different flavors you can experience in the tea? Right. Tell me about what's the front palate. What's the mid palate? You know, what's the back palate? What's, you know, what's the, what's the lingering after, after taste? It's like whilst you're trying to learn to type. Okay. It's like that's going to distract the shit out of you. And make you a much worse time. Imagine if you're learning to drive whilst doing that. It's like that would be dangerous, right? And so, attending to bodily sensations, whether it's taste or the sensation of muscles activating, right, is uh, yeah takes conscious attention, right? And so, when you take your conscious attention, we can't dev- You know, there's just f- mountains of research saying that humans are terrible um, multitaskers. Um, and and that we can't actually divide our attention. What we do when we multitask is we attend to one thing and then we quickly switch to the other thing and then switch back. So we don't actually, we don't attend to two things at once. We, we, we switch between the two. And every time you switch between one task and another, there's a called a task switching cost, which basically it takes you a, a little bit of time to reorient yourself to the new task. And so basically you, you know, if you're doing two things at once, it takes you more than twice as long as just doing, you know, one thing and then doing the other thing, right? Um, because you have that task switching cost and you probably do worse work in both tasks and take longer, you know? So it's like, it's it's not like to, to get better at like operating the reformer, should you A, focus on operating the reformer well, or B, try and operate the reformer well whilst thinking about you know, internal sensations in your body. And I would submit that based on a wide body of evidence, it's, it's A, right? It's the answer. <laughs> it's like, if you want to get yeah. better at operating the reformer, focus on operating the reformer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and going back to a priority list, maybe, maybe it's part of your business model or your teaching philosophy that you want your students to learn about muscles. That would be fine. I'm, my argument is just that not as a beginner, save that for later once they already know how to operate the machine. Save it for later. It doesn't have to be. I think, I think, I mean, I think there's a, there's a place for educating people about, you know, oh, this exercise is really good for your glutes or this exercise is really good for your leg strength or whatever. Like, I think there's benefit to that. Uh, and there might be like particular clients because it can be motivating, right? So if I come and my, my goal is to get strong legs and you're like, oh, Raph, this one's really good for your leg strength. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm going to try harder at it, right? So that, that can be really motivating. Um, uh, and there, you know, there might be particular clients who have an interest in anatomy. Like maybe I'm a medical student or maybe whatever. And you're like, hey, Raph, this is good for your like pronator teres muscle, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, pronator teres, that's cool. Um, you know, but, but that's going to be a minority, right? I think most clients 
come to Pilates not because they like desperate to learn anatomy, but because they want to feel better and be able to do life, you know, more effectively. Right? They want to get rid of their back pain or play with their grandkids or whatever, um, or live longer or feel happier or have more social. You know, like it's not because like oh, I've always wanted to learn anatomy, therefore I'll go do Pilates. Like that's I don't think that's the problem that we're solving for most people. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't really see it as like, it's a given that you should educate your clients about anatomy. I can see there's a place for it with some clients. I think there's a motivational element to it for some people. Um, but I don't know for for your grandma, you know, Mrs. Jones, who's there and she's just like, she doesn't know her freaking pronated Terry's from her psoas. And she won't ever have to. <laughs> no, she doesn't, she doesn't care. Right. She just wants to be able to carry her shopping up the stairs and you know, hang out the, hang out the washing on the line. Um, you know, like, it, so we were motivating for her to say, Hey, this will help you carry your shopping. This one's really good for helping you hang out the washing, right? That would be more motivating for that person, I think. So I think, yeah, there's a place for educating people about anatomy, but I think it's, it's a relatively small place. There's a place for it too. So going back to your example of, you know, if you come to me and you're like, I really want to work my legs today and you're a new student and you're, you're a new Pilates client to me. I might, you know, I might throw on an extra spring and footwork, or maybe we'll do, I don't know, semicircle or something like that. And I might just say, hey, Raph, this one's good for your legs. But that's what I would say. I wouldn't say, hey, this one's good for your legs. Now, when I'm trying to teach you semicircle, I want you to really focus on the sensations you have in your thighs and your hamstrings. Like, no, I mean, you just don't have to do that. Like simply saying, hey, this one's good for your legs is enough. Or like if, you know, an, uh, if the student really wants to work their back line, it's like, hey, throw on a long box and lie down belly down and we'll get some pull straps. Like that's all you need to say. You don't have to go into the whole biomechanics and purpose of why you're doing that. I used to do that. And I think some students absolutely loved it. <laughs> some students absolutely loved it. But I think from a from a teaching perspective, it just got to be too much talking. That's part of it. And I think that's, uh, as I say that, that's probably the last strategy I have um, for working with students is just keep it simple and short. Keep it short and simple. In your cues, your explanations, get them moving, keep it short and simple. They don't need the whole thing. Yep. They don't need the lecture about why we do the things we do and what it's good for. I mean, if they ask, yeah, but. Well, imagine if you went to the dentist, right? And you're there in the dentist chair and the dentist doing some drilling process and they go, I'm using a number 17 drill bit here because blah, blah, blah. And here are the 99 reasons I'm using that particular drill bit and it's manufactured. And it's, it's like, you don't give a shit, you know, like, like that's the equivalent, you know, or I'm mixing the amalgam for your filling. And I like to use, you know, broad strokes in a horizontal plane, you know, left to right when I'm mixing the amalgam and here's why, blah, blah. It's like, you don't give a shit, you know, just fix, fix my freaking tooth, dude. Like, <laughs> that's all I'm here for. And and that's the same with Pilates. Like dentists, I imagine, I you know, dentists out there, I imagine you, you can get excited by like new dental equipment and the, you know, new you know, techniques in dentistry and whatever. But like as a member of the public, I don't give a shit, right? I just want my teeth fixed. And I think as Pilates instructors, we get super excited about anatomy and biomechanics and Pilates history and this and that. But the public by and large don't give a shit. They just want to feel stronger and, you know, not have sore back and, and all, be able to hang out there washing, you know, that's all I care about. It's true. And if they do care about all of those, all of those things, convince them to become Pilates teachers and then they can be part right. of our gang. And then we can just sit here like talking and talking about Pilates. I mean, imagine if, if the plumber came to fix your sink and they felt compelled to educate you about if all the, every wrench and why they're doing every thing. It's like, oh my God, how boring, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, actually. So, um, my, there's a lot of things I'm not interested in and the only person I feel empowered to do this with is my husband, but there are times when I need to ask him a question and I will say, can you please explain this to me in three sentences or less? And if he says no, then I'm like, never mind, I'll Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, the, that reminds me. So the other thing is like, um, there's this thing that there's this game that I play with my kids and I, I want to, I try to do this with my beginner students. I call it the cookie and biscuit test and cookie and biscuit are a niece and nephew that I have. They live in Italy 
and they are 10 and seven. And whenever my kids come home from school and they'll say, oh, I learned this in geometry today, or I learned this in algebra today, I will ask them, can you explain this concept to me as if I were cookie and biscuit? So I try to do that with my Pilates. My beginner students is like, will it pass the cookie and biscuit test? Will they understand what I'm saying? It has to be short and simple and sweet. And if I can do that, then I've, I've won. So keep it short and simple and sweet people. And you've given me a hankering for some cookies and biscuits. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like in Australia and maybe in parts of Europe too, you guys call cookies biscuits correct? Yeah. We don't really have the word cookie. I mean, we kind of do now because we see so much American media, but uh, we, I, I would refer to like sweet biscuits is I guess what you guys would call cookies. Uh, oh, and we would, okay. we would use like savory biscuits for, you know, like things that you put cheese on. Yeah. When I think of a biscuit here, I think of what you would get at a, like a fried chicken barbecue or fried chicken like a, shop, you know, I like- guess we'd call that a scone. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, we, because we, we read, you know, we read um, novels and things and about America, and people talk about oh, biscuits and gravy for, you know, for breakfast or whatever, and, uh, re- and we always wonder like, what the heck is biscuits, you know? And I mean, I know what gravy is, but like, what is, what are these biscuits people are talking like? Are they sweet? Are they savory? Are they cheesy? Are they like what are they? Uh, and uh, I was recently in Florida a couple of months back, and the hotel had biscuits and gravy, like one of the things there for breakfast. I'm like, oh, I'm going to try that. I'm like, oh, this is just scones. <laughs> That's well, what it is. We wouldn't, I, I, I feel like there's a, a difference between a scone and a biscuit here in America, but that's cool. You can have a scone and, a, and gravy, <laughs> scone with sausage gravy. Well, Did uh, you to, like it? To be honest, to be honest, no, it wasn't really, uh, I, uh, the, the expectation was greater than the reality, let's just say for me. Um, because I was like really excited to try it. I was like, oh, that sounds really, you know, nice. But I like a lot of the, I love a lot of the food that I, that I've been introduced to in America. But, uh, so I've become pretty enamored of just plain black, um, drip coffee. Love it. Love it. As opposed to what? As opposed to just in Australia, the standard coffee that you have would be an espresso coffee. Like, yeah. Um, so when you like in, in America, like, you know, as you know, you can get like basically everywhere to go to it, like a, a gas station or a convenience store or anywhere. They've got like a pot of black coffee that you can just go and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and if you go into a restaurant, you say, just give me a black coffee. It's like, they know what you mean. It's just like pour it out of the, out of the jug. Uh, in Australia, that's not a thing. Um, that is just like, there's probably, you know, n- places just don't have, filter coffee. Um, so some play like wherever you buy coffee, when you say I'll have a coffee, they're like, what kind? Do you want an es- a espresso, a long black, a short black, a cappuccino, a latte, a macchiato? Uh, so it's like all of the fancy coffees, but we don't have the just the plain black coffee. So that's one of my great pleasures when I go to the US is I just is ordering coffee by just saying one coffee, please. And they know what you mean. <laughs> you don't have to specify. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we've we've got ourselves a, a dripper later here in Australia. Love it. Um, and the other thing is, like, because espresso is so much stronger, you can have like you know nine cups of filter coffee yeah, for every <laughs> cup of espresso yeah. that you have. So it's awesome. It's true. Um, yeah, yeah, that is definitely uh, and, a a pleasure is to drink coffee mm. for a lo- just sip your coffee for a long time. Take a like the kind that Adam has, like a big big cup of coffee forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I'm I'm envious of Adam when I whenever I watch him there on Zoom. Another thing, like in the US, I think the especially in the southern US, obviously, but the the Mexican food and the South American food is just like orders of magnitude better um, than it is in Australia uh, than I've ever tasted in Australia anyway. Like uh, again in Florida, but also in like Arizona, in Southern California, um, in Utah, like even the 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 Mexican food, the the Colombian food is just amazing. Chilean food, yeah. In Florida, that was amazing. We went to Bahama, Bahamanian restaurant as well. It's just like, just I love that South American, Central American food. It's amazing. And I've never got it in Australia, like even one-tenth as good as, as the southern US. Well, I guess maybe we need to have a big staff meeting 
in the mm. US at some point. Oh, yeah. Well, we had one in the Philippines a uh, couple of weeks back, uh, but only with like a, a quarter of the team. So that didn't inspire me. And I thought, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we all got together um, in one place? Yes, it would. Yeah, I vote mm. for that. You know what? A lot. Now we're talking about food. Um, also, barbecue, southern barbecue. OMG, like, holy cow, that stuff is amazing. <laughs> like, if it wasn't for the yeah. cholesterol, I would eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. <laughs> yeah, the barbecue is amazing. Yeah, Florida is a, a great place because there are so many different kinds of cuisines and cultures. It's a huge melting yeah. pot. You've probably got a lot of good stuff. Yeah, we went to this amazing Colombian restaurant. Yeah, it's just fantastic Cuban food. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. and all of that, like, Probably, you know, I don't I mean, if you're in the US, I don't know. Maybe this sounds like, yeah, boring. But like for us here in Australia, that's like so exotic and, you know, exciting. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Good talk. Um, so basically, uh, if you want to, if you want to turn beginners into long term clients, the best strategy is say hi within five minutes, orient them into the space. Uh, at the start of class, give them an absolute minimum rundown, what the bare, 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 bare least instructions you can give them. In my view, it's just the springs. Natalie seems to prefer to also tell them about the gear bar and the stopper. Um, and then just position them in the middle of class, pair them up with a buddy um, to, to copy off, introduce them, and then position yourself in class so that as you're about to tell them to put the foot bar up or put on the loops or adjust their box or whatever, you're just physically there right next to them and you're actually doing it for them whilst you instruct the rest of the class. Uh, and uh, keep it, you know, load them, give them like basically the same spring setting as everybody else, but keep the effort level to mild or moderate so that they don't get massive DOMs. So avoid like pushing them right towards failure and avoid like prolonged um, ex, like stretch plus strength exercises like splits and, and back bends and things. Uh, give them some wins, give them like an easier version of the exercise or just an easy version of the cueing for the exercise that just says, hey, if your foot's here and your hand's here and the carriage is moving, you're doing it right. High five, you're awesome. Here's a harder version because I don't usually progress people this quickly, but you're exceptional. So here you go. Um, at the end, I uh, so use external cues. So talk about, you know, push the carriage out, move the straps, lift the, you know, front of your T-shirt, whatever it might be. Uh, normalize the sensations. So, yes, you're meant to be feeling this in your in your abs or your butt or your legs or your neck or whatever. Right now, that's normal. Don't worry. That's what everyone else is feeling too. That means you're doing it right. Uh, uh, at the end, explain about DOMS. Just warn them for that so they don't freak out if and when it happens and tell them when to come back. Yeah. And if you don't want them to come back, teach them rocking and ants on a log. All right. Good talk. <laughs> Good talk.